Pike engaged the differences and continuities between film and video, analog and digital media as he explored the moving image. The presence, as I've mentioned, of the Nam Chun Pike archive at the American Art Museum will further, uh, certainly provide further insight into Pike's working methods and uh, his writings and correspondence which has been a sort of subtext of reference in these presentations, indicate the movement of ideas through his work, from an interest uh, in cybernetics to critical reflections on history and politics, all informed by a wide range of textual references from Asian and European thought and philosophy to incisive comments on the shifting power of global politics and culture. Uh, I'm going to focus on the period uh, beginning in the late 1950s and extending through to the early 1970s. And this time draws attention to a fundamental set of strategies pursued by the artists, practices that engage in a, what I call performative treatment of process as a living and ongoing means to explore and break down the categories that have divided and too often isolated one art practice from another. Issues that remained at the core of his art practice over the following decades. In the late 1950s and early 1960s, Nam Jun met a number of artists that were important to his formative work in this period, and we've heard reference to them. He met Karl Heinz Stockhausen in 1958 when he studied and began working at Westdeutsche Rundfunk Studio for Electronic Music in Cologne, Germany. And that same year, Pike attended the International Summer Course for New Music in Darmstadt, where he met John Cage. Now, in 1961, he began uh, his uh, friendship with George Machunas, as you have mentioned, founder of Fluxus, one of the communities, I think this is very important, communities of avant-garde artists active in this period and responding to the everyday norms of post-war society. Another key textual collaboration uh, was with uh, Wolf Fostel in, on the publication Day Collage in 1961. It is important to, I think, to acknowledge and to examine this network of friendships and contexts through which Pike moved as he realized openings for pursuing his ideas. And Stockhausen's description of a performance by Pike in 1961, in which uh, Nam Jun performed uh, Simple, which we heard from, I think I'm doing the right thing. Oh, golly. I'm hitting the corner right here. Oh, is there another? Wow. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we've heard mention of this from uh, 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 Stephen, uh, some d description of this uh, piece. Um, um, uh, Zen for, and uh, simple, I just mentioned some of these pieces. Zen for head, uh, uh, simple Zen for head, and etude platonique number three. As part of Stockhausen's originale, it really gives a sense of Pike's active approach to performance is improvisation and chance than the mixing of media and a kind of confrontation. Uh, Stockhausen admiringly noted that Pike performed his performance every day and changed it every day. And here is an excerpt, which I love to quote Stockhausen's description, which is interesting to hear, I think, after what we just saw from uh, the video, uh, the film sequence from Riganalo. Pake came out to the stage in sh silence and shocked most of his audience by his actions as quick as lightning. For example, he threw beans against the ceiling, which was above the audience. He then hid his face behind a roll of paper, which he unrolled infinitely slowly in breathless silence. He screamed as he suddenly threw the roll of paper into the audience. And at the same moment, he switched on two tape recorders with what was a sound montage consisting of women's screams, radio news, children's noise, fragments of classical music, and electronic sounds. Finally, he jumped into a bathtub filled with water, dived completely underwater, jumped soaking wet to the piano, and began a sentimental salon piece. He then fell forward 
and hit the piano keyboard several times with his head. A description that very much fits what we saw in the, in the sequence. We can further illustrate this movement between media and materials in his participation in Bagatelle Americans. In 1962, performed as part of the Neo Dada and Der Musik, uh, the Kammerspiel in Dusseldorf in 1962. Oh, man. Oh, come on. Uh -uh. You know, I'm hitting the right place. This gentleman came up here. I. What? What is? Why is it shift? I don't know. Oh, excuse me. Um, um, here we see uh, Nam June, uh, uh, here we see Pike's uh, direct initial, as Stephen was referring to, manipulation of record players. He would scratch and smash phonograph records, as well as working with tape recorders, creating in, this, in the process the multidimensional sensorial experience that is central to his work uh, in this period. In other words, the stage becomes what he calls a mobile theater for manipulating and transforming musical instruments and sound recording reproduction technologies, tape recorders, phonograph players, and radios, which anticipate his treatment of the television set. As Pike wrote in 1963, I am tired of renewing the form of music. I must renew the ontological form of music. In the moving theater, in the street, the sounds move in the street. The audience meets and encounters them unexpectedly in the street. The beauty of the moving theater lies in the surprise a priori, because almost all of the audience is invited, not knowing what it is, who it is, who is the composer, the player, the organizer, or better speaking, organizer, composer, player this description of this mobile theater written in the New Ontology of Music in 1961. Now we see that illustrated here in his performance score, which reference has been made to, uh, of for Symphony for 20 Rooms. All right, there's the hand. Now. Ah. <laughs> oh, I feel pretty good which describes how Pike saw performance. Now this, uh, the Symphony for 20 Rooms, a really key piece here, because it describes how Pike saw performance as taking place all at once in different spaces and creating a fluid ongoing collage of events not defined by one medium or purpose. The audience moves and the sounds and experiences change from room to room. This performance score is important, I think as it anticipates uh, his 1963 One Artist exhibition uh, that Edith has mentioned at the Gallery Parnas in Wuppertal. His use of rooms which became spaces for a mobile theater of sound and moving image making. The title of the show, Exposition of Music Electronic Television. Well, you know, I love showing this image. So. Oh, great. Um, and uh, really makes explicit in the title uh, the linking, uh, the joining of sound with television um, in, in the title and the disassembly of their instrumentality. And here are the uh, prepared um, uh, pianos uh, as they're distributed about the room. And here is Pike, Nanju and again, this notion that Edith was referring to this challenge to the musical instrument to change the look of it and to change its instrumentality and its sound, its visuality. And it really, as we saw, as we see in the distribution of the televisions, here we see the pianos as this classical instrument being reoriented and uh, uh, destroyed. Uh, here's Nam Jun with his prepared televisions. Uh, directly uh, engaging those TVs. And here this distribution, as we see here, both 
in terms of different positions, upside down, sideways, that Edith again was referring to. And Pike really, I mean, sought to overcome the very institution of television as he had radically assaulted the formal place and iconicity of the piano in performance. And through this strategy, he sought to transform, reconfigure the apparatus of the television set. Further, he disrupted through the collage, decollage, decollage technique of breaking, tearing into the flow of the broadcast image. This, is, uh, this image is very important to this, um, where it's not about the tape that's being played, but it's about tearing into in a kind of decollage, this decollage technique, thus remaking the surface, the trace of the electronic line on the cathode ray too. Early on, Pike saw television not as a one-way conduit of reception, but implicitly and directly as an interactive instrument, directly related to his interactive sound makers. Random access on view in the galleries, where he takes a, apart the audio tape player and participants rub the head of the player over the audio tape fixed to the wall, as well as um, uh, we see Pike uh, you know, physically, bodily intervening into the record player. Here he's breaking apart the audio tape player and making a new kind of interactive process, a performance by the viewer with the, with the medium and the materials. Just as his performances radically changed that we saw within uh, Stuckhausen's theatrical plan, so Pike sought to constantly change and make flexible his audio and video works. And it's important to remember that Pike worked directly with the electronics, and the Namjoon Pike archive has fascinating electronics uh, manuals as well as a variety of video components drawn from as early as the 1950s and extending across the following decades. Um, here is um, Nam Jun in his uh, uh, Canal Street studio in 1965 after moving to New York City. And I like to show this image because it shows his direct hands-on uh, treatment, understanding of the technology. And he, he worked with people, but he had this fundamental, this genius of, under, of comprehending what this technology was and thus how he could transform it. Um, after, um, uh, in 1965, he had his first one artist exhibition at the New School entitled Nam June Pike, Electronic TV, Color TV Experiments, Three Robots, Two Zen Boxes, and One Zen Can. Fantastic title. Um, uh, it, which was an interactive display. As we see, th the objects, the elements were distributed on the table. The idea was that you could go and interact with it. And featuring his um, uh, magnet uh, uh, TV, which we have on view in the exhibition, uh, where, the, where the magnet on the television creates this moving image which can be changed as you interacted with it, as you manipulated the magnet. There was no single view, it was a changing view um, up to the viewer and participant in the piece. Now, um, and here's his, elect, uh, his demagnetizer or life ring, the electromagnet placed directly onto the cathode ray tube. Once again, interactive and drawing, and also drawing out an imagery specific to the medium. And I think this is very important. That it's, it's, he's not making fashioning something that looks like something else. It's coming out of the very properties of the medium, just as an artist works with the properties of the materials that he or she is working with. Now, this performative engagement with traditional musical and sound instruments, as well as television sets, was also articulated in film. He was very aware of the avant-garde film and had friendships with many film artists. And the archive makes clear the importance from early on of filmmakers um, such as Judd Yalkut, of course, and Jonas Mikas, Robert Breer, Stan Vanderbeek, 
filmmakers whose work he included in his videotapes and later television projects. And I feel that this really can't be stressed enough. As I wrote in the catalog for the Worlds of Namjoon Pike exhibition, Pike must be seen in relationship to film and thus to the history of the moving image. Um, Zen for film, not for 1964, is important in locating the performative strategy to Pike's interest in the expanded view of the moving image. John Cage related uh, the experience of the film to his composition, Four Minutes, 33 Seconds from 1952. Uh, the film consists, Zen for film, consists of 28 minutes of clear leader, which becomes marked by dust and scratches and thus changes in each proje projection with added marks and traces. As Nam June told me, when I screened it at the Guggenheim, make sure it spends time on the floor. And he wrote for the new cinema festival, the one screening in 1965, that the light motif was how to make film without filming how to convert the film to live performing art form, art from canned art to cooked food. He also included a performance of Etude plat Platonique and, and was described in the poster for this as being screened twice, once dedicated to Fluxus and again realized by Fluxus. And again, this is the kind of evidence one has from these performances by going back to the original announcements and, and, and knowing exactly, begin to understand that kind of experience, temporal experience that was happening in the performance. Now Zen for Film was projected onto a wall or uh, screened, capturing one's shadows if you're in front, as well as marks picked up on the celluloid. Now I see the film as an interactive piece, essentially making film live through what happens in real time to the film and within the beam of light from the projector. The projection of the film of the film on video is problematic. It's often shown, the film is often shown an exhibition on video. Since video is not the material celluloid, it always remains the same. And, and it essentially then becomes a, a remnant, a static version of the piece. And um, I'd like to show the Zen for film al alongside, um, uh, was that, was there something on the screen? Yeah. <sighs> Wait, uh, there was a slide of Zen for film, right? Yeah, and it faded off. And it faded off. Yeah. And there was Misa of Zen. Someone should have told me, or I should have mirrors here, Tony. <laughs> Because the idea was that I was now going to click on Tamisa of Zen, which you just saw, and I didn't realize it. Okay, so this is really turning into a performance. Um, <laughs> I, I wanted to place Zen for film alongside Misa of Zen from 1967, uh, in which the screen, as you saw, is seen from the side. Um, the um, Filmed by Judd Yalkut, it is a treatment of the cathode ray tube screen itself by displacing the image content, occupying a place, as the title suggests, between Christian mass and Zen Buddhism. It abstracts television's content into an oblique profile of the screen. I would also play Zen for film in dialogue with film pieces that perform and reflect on the idea of the screen and cinematic apparatus is not grounded in a single model of production or presentation. I think this is what's key here. Here is, um, um, well, there should be another image. Oh yeah, Ooh, I jumped. Can I go back? I can? Yes. Now it's Thank a collaborative you. piece. <laughs> Find the control. Um, you know, every time I do this, I say I'm not doing it again. It's going to take it all the way back that time. No, can it just do one? Just to the film Sukiyaki, the one before it? Doesn't seem to let me do it. Okay, I'll just, um, I'll just talk about it and then I'll keep this. Okay. Okay, what you missed. <laughs> <laughs> 
First you saw something I didn't realize you were looking at. Now I'm not showing you something that I want you to see. Well, anyway, the piece is called Film Suk... I mean, Judd, we're in the same boat here. I'm, um, what I was going to show you was from Tony Conrad's Film Sukiyaki from 1974, where the artist literally threw cooked, processed film at the screen. In other words, and, and it became this metaphor for the production and, and, and projection of the of film. And here we see Stan Vanderbeek's home movies from 1963, where handheld projectors, small super bright projectors, were manipulated by the performers. So in other words, breaking cinema out of its container and making it this performative, fluid work. And I would also be, I think it's also suggestive to connect Zen for Film to his digital experiments at Bell Labs in 1963. Now let's see. Now it's supposed to go to the, I'm sorry, it's supposed to go to the video. He's going? Yep. All right. yeah. There we go. Um, where the, uh, where you, where you see the, um, this, this sort of movement of this information, this pixel uh, information from his digital experiments, as I said, at Bell Labs in 1963. Again, this kind of minimal reduction and treatment of light and material uh, that comes out of this process an engagement, and I think the again these are. Oh, let's see where we go next. Ah, this is so exciting. Okay, here is um, uh, uh, the computer printout composed of random installation entitled "Confused Rain." Very much uh, it's connected to that what we just saw, where the play of chance and change informs the treatment and trace of the computer-driven information. The clear leader of Zen for Film is a printout of change, chance changes captured on the surface of film. And just as random access releases its sound in interaction with the viewer, the light from the projector constantly creates and reflects the changes in the image seen on the screen in Zen for Film. So this period also saw uh, Pike's continuing exploration of new means for processing the electronic image. And I, we can trace these developments to many sources, including the work of Karl Otto Goetz in Germany, whose abstract films from the 1930s led to his abstract paintings and participation in the German Informel Group in the 1950s and 70s. Edith has written about this period. And it was, however, Goetz's early work with radar and oscilloscope that he returned to with the, the emergence in the 1950s of television and later electronic and computer-generated abstraction that interested Pike. Although for Goetz it was too random and improvisational, this randomness was just what interested Pike. In the archive, there is a letter from Goetz to Pike describing his abstractions on the oscilloscope and the struggle to capture them, make them permanent. Again, reminding us of the importance of such film artists as James Whitney's Lapis from the same period, 1963, uh, 66, and Jordan Belson's Zomedy from 1967. Their handmade films are a key precedent to the development of the electronic image processing. Here, Greg Zinman's, uh, who we're gonna be hearing from, research and writings have made a significant contribution to our understanding of, these, of this history. As we've seen, Judd Yelkut's collaboration with Pike in filming his manipulations of broadcast are a key part of this history. Once again, showing the relationships between analog and digital moving image technologies as artists worked these mediums. The recognition of the development of image processors owes much to uh, a, a whole community of artists, and think of course of Woody and Stana Vazulka, both through their own work as well as, and I always want, whenever I talk about this, mention their landmark exhibition and research into the history of image processing. 
But it was with the Pike Abbe video synthesizer, which we've heard reference to, uh, developed with Shoya Abe, a Japanese engineer, that Pike would create endless variations in form and color, synthesizing, manipulating, transforming the electronic moving image as he collaged television and film sources into this process, all of which Pike would introduce into a vast array of artworks, from single-channel videotapes to installations and telecast performances over the decades of the 70s, 80s, and 90s. I want to show you uh, an excerpt from a documentary from the BBC of his gallery Bonino, Bonino show in 1968, which uh, shows Pike's real-time manipulation of the moving image. Side of West 57th Street is an exhibition by a South Korean artist, Nam Jun Paik. He's been taking to heart the words of the prophet of the electronic age, Marshall McLuhan. If the age of the spectator has ended in our present time, for example, television is an x-ray, not a pictorial, not a visual form, it's x-ray. And people go inside things. They get involved and they go inside themselves. Pake has gone one better. He gets inside the television image itself. His raw material, recordings of television shows on videotape and he distorts them with electromagnets and switching devices. A transformer varying the voltage passing through the magnets changes the picture. Ironically, the television program which Pate is using here is about Marshall McLuhan himself. A foot switch turns the magnet on and off, giving a sort of electronic massage to McLuhan's face. Um, I think it's a, it's a wonderful representation showing Nam doing that wobbly dial and all. And I just want to mention that on view in the exhibition is, uh, a, 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 on loan from the estate, is this drawing of Nam Jun, a plan for the Pike Abbe video synthesizer. And Abbe was just astonished, I mean, that he had this full comprehension and understanding of what could happen, how this would be designed and worked. Um, as I've noted, uh, Pike viewed television not simply as a one-way conduit of reception, but implicitly and concretely as a means of open communication. And I'm going to conclude with a piece from 1970, an extraordinary production, TV Commune, Beatles Beginning to End, Judd has referenced it, created in Boston and telecast as a multi-hour, four-hour long transmission to a local public access affiliate, WGBX 44. Now, what I'm showing you is an excerpt uh, from an eight minute film of that event by Judd. And what we see, and I want to show this excerpt without uh, sound. Ah. Um, is a TV studio that becomes, in Nam June's hand, a mobile theater, a laboratory, a performance space a screening room, a site where the Pike Abbey City video synthesizer and audio analyzers are used as tools to remix and remake all of what was going on into a new television, a new creative process, a real-time event that implicitly captured the viewer as well as the on-site participants. TV Commune joined the handmade interactive devices with electronics, to create an open space for exploration. Pike's transformation of the TV studio celebrated an art practice that was, as I'm arguing here, dramatically expand over the following decades as Nam June's mobile theater developed a new, ever expansive and inclusive forms of moving image making. Thank you very much.